Mr. Nordlinger, thank you for joining us here at the TV studios of The Voice of America. It's an honor. Mr. Nordlinger, numerous books have been written on the subject of tyrannical leaders and dictators. You have chosen to place focus exclusively on the children of the tyrants. Uh, why did you pick this subject? What do you believe is the significance of studying uh, the mere offsprings of the powerful leaders? Well, one reason to do it was that it hadn't been done before. There are many books, as you know, about dictators, and pretty much none on their children until now. And I thought it was an interesting side of life, side of history. Most of these children, sons and daughters, men and women, are just footnotes or asides. They're bit players on the stage of history. Even so, they're interesting. Sometimes they become main players when they succeed their father as dictator, as has happened twice in North Korea, once in Syria, once in Haiti, and other times elsewhere in the world. You examine various cases of children of, of tyrants in your book. Uh, some of these children, many of them are loved by their parents, by their father, some ignored, some even reviled. Uh, were you able to discern any common thread among these children, however? I mean, were you able to see something that binds them in experience? Well, what is most common, obviously, is that they are the son or daughter of a dictator. That's their commonality. Otherwise, they lead individual lives and they cope with their peculiar circumstance or common circumstance in their own ways, in their own individual ways. But I think most of these men and women are loyal to their father. A few of them, maybe more than a few, feel a conflict and express certain doubts, even rebellion. But the innermost thoughts of most of these people, of course, have to be unknown uh, unless they choose to express them in one way or the other. But what they have in common mainly is that they have been dealt this hand. They grow up in a cult of personality, the one centered on their father. You have put an incredible amount of time into researching your subjects, these children uh, of these leaders. Uh, was there some particular case that stood out for you, that shocked you, that surprised you, that perhaps even warmed your heart? Yes. Uh, I find all these stories interesting, sometimes all too interesting for the people who've had to live these lives. Um, I was slightly surprised that so many of the children were loyalists or seeming loyalists. I thought there might be more dissent than I found. Uh, the dissenters are highly interesting. It's hard not to be moved by the story of Svetlana Stalin, Stalin's daughter, who defected to the United States in 1967. It's hard not to be moved by the story of one of Castro's daughters, Fidel Castro's daughters in Cuba, Alina Fernandez, who defected to the United States in 1993. She's kind of a Cuban Svetlana. Uh, the stories of the Tojo children are highly interesting. The Mussolini children lived very Italian, I would say, operatic lives, all too dramatic and operatic lives. Uh, Pol Pot had a daughter late in his life. He was about 60 in Cambodia. She's a beautiful young woman of about 30 now. She got married last year. She is highly interesting. So I mean, the Qaddafi kids are often ghoulish, fascinating in a macabre way. Same with Saddam's two sons, of course. I could go on. Now you mentioned Svetlana Aleluyeva. This is a bit personal for me because I grew up in a country called Soviet Union and my family was affected by the policies of uh, Joseph Stalin. What was Stalin's deal? I mean, in what way does your book help us understand better this man? He was a gangster. He was a killer. He was full of resentment and anger. He wanted to reshape the world, smash the world, control it. He wanted the world under his boot. He felt himself born to rule. He was a megalomaniac 
and I regret to say he was very, very smart, which is how he got to the top and stayed there. Most of these dictators are very brainy, high IQ people, talented, personable. I'm very sorry to say this, and they use their powers for bad. There's a Freudian approach to doing history where you go to the childhood of the tyrants to study, to understand the root cause, the breaking point, the fall. Uh, what about children having impact on parents? There's a point comes, a, a point of fatherhood where a person becomes a father, they have children. Uh, does that, did you see anything in studying these cases where there was an impact by a child on his father? That's an excellent question, and I haven't been asked it by anyone. I can't think of a case where a son or daughter softened the father. Often, the father had a tender spot for the son or daughter, especially a daughter. These guys tend to love their daughters if they love anyone, especially a firstborn daughter. But while they might have been tender at home, these dictators, I don't think this tenderness influenced or leavened the the iron nature, the cruel nature of the rule. I want to focus on the subject of evil, which, which really your book is about. Mm -hmm. You have these people who are, like you said, good fathers at home, kind toward their own children, yet... Some of them. Some yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. Yet their policies result in killing, leaving many children fatherless. Yes. And in some cases, killing thousands of children. Oh, yes. How, how were you able to uh, reconcile this sort of dissonance, or were you not? All these dictators fancied themselves doing good. A dictator doesn't wake up in the morning and think, what sort of evil deeds can I do today? A dictator deludes himself that he is indispensable to his country, maybe even indispensable to humanity, and he's going to spend his day doing good, even if it involves breaking a few eggs to make this beautiful omelet. And as Orwell pointed out, not only are the eggs broken, not only are these innocent people crushed, killed, imprisoned, otherwise persecuted, there's never an omelet. You went into this project uh, thinking about what you wanted to write, having some idea of what you were going to write about, what you were going to focus on. Uh, however, uh, we know that writers sometimes, once they do their research, they mm. come out, they find things that kind of change them. Did you find anything that, were you changed by after, by writing this book? Yes, I'm sure in, in several ways. I do a little less generalizing and psychologizing in this book than I thought I would, because every time I went to make a general statement, I could contradict it with one or two or three instances. So there is generalizing and psychologizing, mainly in two parts of the book the forward and the afterward. I give my opinions and address themes, patterns, commonalities. In between, in the main, you have stories, individual life stories, sketches. So readers have been drawing their own conclusions about loyalty, fatherhood, sonship or daughtership, tyranny, democracy, the rule of law, nature, nurture, all of these questions come up in my book. Thank you, Mr. Norlinger, for the interview. Delighted.